Honourable Senators, it is with a heavy heart that I rise today to again speak to the third reading of Bill C-7, the Trudeau government's bill to expand assisted suicide. It was less than five years ago when many of us stood in this chamber to debate Bill C-14, the bill that legalized what advocates have termed medical assistance in dying or MAID. It is alarming to see in the current bill, C-7, just how quickly the Trudeau government dismantled some of the very safeguards many of us, including the government, insisted on in Bill C-14. That bill provided Canadians at or near the end of their lives with the means to hasten their deaths. Today, we are discussing expanding that regime to include access for Canadians for whom death is not reasonably foreseeable, so that now people may be seeking access to end their lives many years before their anticipated natural deaths. Amendments brought in recent days in this chamber blow the bill wide open to include people suffering with mental illness and allow for advanced directives. The implications are profound and, I believe, tragic. We are supposed to be a chamber of sober second thought, colleagues, but I am afraid you have put in motion a runaway train and the consequences will be dire. Under the Sunset Clause, for the next 18 months, while the government is supposed to be preparing to allow assisted suicide for people with mental illness, look what is going on in the world outside these walls. This pandemic is raging. Our health care system is buckling under its pressure. Persons with disabilities face a COVID-19 triage protocol that places their lives at the bottom of the list in a competition for scarce resources. Our mental health care system is also a casualty, as we face a shadow pandemic of mounting anxiety, suicidality and substance abuse. Yet it seems the Trudeau government will continue full steam ahead with this enormous and unwise shift in social policy in Canada. In the next 18 months, during a global pandemic, shouldn't we focus on saving Canadians' lives instead of helping so many more die? Make no mistake, in passing Bill C-7, we are not following the dictates of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Carter decision. In Carter, that court stated, quote, the scope of this declaration is intended to respond to the factual circumstances in this case. We make no pronouncement on other situations where physician-assisted dying may be sought, quote. Death was reasonably foreseeable for the plaintiffs in Carter, so that case tells us nothing about the constitutionality of Bill C-7, which asks us to extend MAID beyond easing people into a less painful death to offering death as a response to a painful life. There is little doubt that Bill C-7 will be overturned by Canadian courts because it violates the charter rights of persons with disabilities. The equality analysis of this bill may turn on whether we characterize medical assistance in dying as a benefit. If it is a benefit, why is it only a benefit to people with disabilities and serious and incurable medical conditions? We must confront what it is about disability and irremediable medical conditions that makes that suffering unique and worthy of death when we don't respond to any other suffering that way. We respond to others who suffer intolerably with active suicide prevention efforts, and where necessary to save a life, we say, damn your autonomy, your life matters. That is what equality demands. The UN Special Rapporteurs have told us that this exceptionalizing of the suffering associated with illness and disability is grounded in our deeply embedded ableism, which devalues the lives of persons with disabilities. They claim that Canada has created a two-tier system in which some Canadians get suicide prevention while others get suicide assistance. We know from the case law in Section 15 of the Charter that laws that single out disability for special treatment based on ableist assumptions about the value of disabled lives or the uniqueness of their suffering will be found to violate Section 15. We already have three international experts telling us this bill is discriminatory. And why is it precisely those we say we are benefiting, disabled Canadians, who are fighting this bill so vigorously? They are telling us, in fact screaming to be heard, that they don't want this so-called benefit. What they want from Section 15 is equal protection of the law and the safeguard that the reasonable foreseeability of natural death clause provides to all other suffering Canadians. And what they want from government is not a fast track to death but rather the necessary financial and other supports that give them the option to live a dignified life. None of the litigation that has thus far taken place has heard from plaintiffs who have been pressured into MAID or have felt their lives devalued by MAID. Those cases will come if we pass this bill. In fact, Mr. Truchon himself said he did not want to die. He wanted to live in his community, closer to his loved ones. Yet our response to Mr. Truchon was not to say we will support you to live in your community. Our response was that he had a constitutional right to die. The constitutional right to life was simply too expensive. 
Many members in this place speak so loftily of human rights, of the beloved charter, of autonomy. But your vote for this bill sends the message to persons with disabilities that living with a disability is a fate worse than death. What does that say about their human rights, honourable senators? Is it true autonomy when you feel like you have no uh, viable options other than death because the system has discriminated against you all your life? What charter right is engaged when an able-bodied person who is suicidal receives life-affirming suicide intervention, but a person with disabilities is offered assisted suicide as a rational choice because, you're right, your suffering must be intolerable, there's just no hope for you. And what is the effect of offering that same message to people suffering with mental illness? In many situations, the trust in the patient-psychiatrist relationship may be the only thing that is keeping someone who is suicidal alive. As our committee heard from psychiatrist Dr. Sephora Tang, quote, my patients need to see that I remain firm in giving them hope, that I'm not going to give up on them even if in a moment of desperation they want to end their lives. They need to come to me and be guaranteed that I'm not going to collude in their suicidal urges and their hopelessness, because my job as a psychiatrist is to give them hope when they have lost all hope, quote. For a psychiatrist to offer assisted suicide to a patient suffering from mental illness is a betrayal of that trust. Offering a suicidal patient the guaranteed lethal means to death is an abandonment of the doctor's professional and ethical obligation to first do no harm. So why is this chamber voting to put mental health professionals in this position? Some senators have called the mental illness exclusion in Bill C-7 unconstitutional, claiming it violates the Section 15 equality rights of people living with mental illness. I strongly disagree. Mental illness must be treated differently than physical illnesses when it comes to accessing MAID due to its inherent nature. Mental illness clearly does not meet one of the essential criteria established to qualify for MAID, that of irremediability. Irremediability does not mean get worse. It does not mean a condition is really bad or intolerable. Irremediability means a condition or illness will never get better. That is just not true when it comes to mental illness. To pretend, to pretend otherwise is itself discriminatory. The issue of assisted suicide in Bill C-7 boils down to a matter of privilege versus one of need, between those who have options in our society and those who do not. We have heard from persons with disabilities, from Indigenous peoples, from black and racialized Canadians, people living in poverty and people suffering from mental illness. Vulnerable Canadians will be the ones to pay the price. I can't even tell you how many times I have heard senators who support the government say in this chamber, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Kind of a hold your nose and pass it anyway sort of maxim. But this bill is nowhere near perfect, and it's certainly not good. In fact, in its time in the Senate, this bill has become so much worse. Where does the great progressive Trudeau government stand on this? This misty-eyed prime minister with his commitment to evidence-based policy and so-called real change? This expansion isn't based in evidence, honourable senators. It's based in ideology. And it's change, all right, but not for the better. It was astonishing, frankly, to see the government leader in this place shuffling his feet and staring at the floor while abstaining on the vote to remove the exclusion of mental illness from this bill. Only a few short weeks ago, Senator Gold, you gave an impassioned and well-reasoned constitutional argument for keeping that very exclusion in place. But now you, you, your government caucus, and even the sponsor of this government bill have nothing to say on that. As Senator Pettyclair said when I gave her the additional chance to defend the exclusion, I said what I wanted to say. Well, Honourable Senators, I haven't. I want to say to my Honourable colleagues in the House of Commons and to you here, Honourable Senators, only three weeks ago it was Bell Let's Talk Day, and many of you signalled your support for mental health through your social media. But posting a couple of tweets once a year just isn't good enough. This is where the rubber hits the road. Either you are on the side of people with mental illness or you are not. We are not doing people with mental illness a favour by allowing them to access assisted suicide. That is not treating them with equality. That is robbing them of hope and handing them a death sentence where there doesn't need to be one. 4,000 Canadians already die by suicide every year, and more than 90% of people who die by suicide suffer with mental illness. In 2019, the number of Canadians who died by MAID was already more than 5,600. And that was before assisted suicide is expanded to include people who are not near death. If Bill C-7 passes as this chamber has amended it, it would not only include people who are not near death, but it would also include people suffering with mental illness and allow advanced directives for those who may not even yet have a diagnosis of anything. 
As a result of this legislation, how many more Canadians will die every year? We must not expand assisted suicide for the same reason we don't have capital punishment in this country and why we haven't had it for as long as I've been alive. Because the state shouldn't have the right to put its citizens to death where there is a risk that sometimes, even just one time, the state might be wrong. Death is sometimes referred to as the great unknown. So too is this new frontier of assisted suicide a great unknown. The government is pushing Canada to charge into that abyss without really knowing where that will lead us. Only a handful of countries have legalized assisted death, fewer still in cases where death is not imminent or on the grounds of psychological suffering. We don't know whether a person who is mentally ill is requesting assisted suicide as a symptom of their illness. We don't know whether the suffering of someone not near death could be eased by offering other social supports and options instead. We won't know how many people may be wrongly put to death when death is not reasonably foreseeable. Even one is too many, honourable senators. As a family survivor of suicide loss, I assure you, one loved one lost is the entire world to someone. Honourable Senators, we need to step back and think critically about this expansion of assisted suicide in this bill. There is no data, no evidence. There has been grossly inadequate consultation. We have very few statistics and not much of a monitoring system. There has been no parliamentary review. This bill casts aside existing safeguards. And last week, you not only agreed with opening this legislation to people nowhere near death and people with disabilities, but now you've extended it to people with neurocognitive disorders, people who are mentally ill, and people who haven't even received a diagnosis of any kind, potentially years in advance from when MAID would currently even be a possibility. Honourable Senators, I really fear we are at the precipice, the point of no return. The parliamentary review was supposed to study extending assisted suicide to people with mental illness, advanced directives and children. It is shameful that in the past few days, in the absence of evidence, in the absence of data and in the seeming complete absence of sober second thought, this chamber has now pushed ahead anyway on people with mental illness and on advanced directives. Thanks to you, Honourable Senators, children are, no, are now the only frontier left. But for how long? How long until you also justify that away under the guise of equality? This is not about aiding people who are already dying to die peacefully. That matter was settled five years ago. This is about the state ending the lives of people prematurely, in some cases by years. This is the very antithesis of what the court ruling in Carter aimed to address, and it is leading us straight into a moral and ethical quagmire. Honourable Senators, I know most of you are voting for this bill and these amendments out of a place of compassion, but I am begging you, please realize that expanding assisted suicide through Bill C-7 will mean that people may die needlessly. Under this ableist, discriminatory law, it may be easier for them to access assisted death than, than to access the right treatment or supports they need to alleviate their suffering and live. I look around this chamber and to you on your screens at home, and I see senators that I know have stood for good in this place. You have offered your words of support and worked on behalf of persons with disabilities, of those with autism, for people who suffer from mental illness and dementia, for Indigenous peoples and for black and racialized Canadians, for those living in poverty and for those who are imprisoned. All of those Canadians stand to lose potentially their lives needlessly if this bill proceeds. Honourable Senators, these Canadians need more than your words of support. They need your action and they need it in this moment. Senators, it isn't too late. You still have the opportunity to do the right thing by voting against this bill. Quite literally, the fate of innumerable Canadians' lives rests in your hands. Choose wisely. Thank you.